Thank you. Uh, we now come to the backbench motion on energy prices. John Penrose to move. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Move the motion which stands in my name and of my co sponsors from Don Valley and from North Air and Arab. Um, I should start, Madam Deputy Speaker, by thanking the Backbench Business Committee for finding the time for us to debate this important and topical motion today, as well as thanking my two co sponsors, and plus the 50 or so MPs from across the political spectrum who all feel the way most energy customers are being treated is sufficiently outrageous and unjust to merit raising it here in the mother of all parliaments. Most industries, Madam Deputy Speaker, believe that customer loyalty is hugely important, an asset to be prized, whether it's a supermarket's loyalty card, an airline's air mile scheme, or just the coffee card that gives you a free cuppa after they stamped it ten times, most businesses reward their most loyal customers with special treatment to keep them coming back. Except for energy. What other industry doesn't give their most loyal customers any discounts or special deals, but charges them higher prices than anyone else instead? Which companies believe that loyalty should be exploited, not rewarded? Who treats their longest-serving customers as chumps to be quietly and secretively switched onto expensive and unfair deals when they aren't looking, and then milked, ripped off mercilessly for as long as possible? The big six energy firms, Madam Deputy Speaker, that's who. The rest of the, en uh, of the energy industry is pretty good. There are 30 or more newish energy firms snapping at the heels of the big six, and they understand that customer loyalty matters if you want to grow. Will my honourable friend give way? Huh? Um, I, I'm grateful, Madam Deputy Speaker, to my honourable friend for giving way. Uh, as my honourable friend will know, uh, there has been a huge rollout of smart meters, which is one way of people keeping an eye on their uh, energy bills. Um, but unfortunately, when people do switch uh, providers, they find that their smart meter uh, often has to be replaced at the same time. And does my honourable friend agree that this is one reason why perhaps some people are, are becoming unwilling to change providers? Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, there are many reasons why um, switching has not caught on to anything like the degree that we need it to if we're going to transform this, uh, th this sector. Uh, I understand that one of the factors may very well be this problem with the introduction of smart meters, but there are others too, so he's quite right to point at it. I I'm going to point at some others as well later on in my speech, if I can. So I was saying there are... 30 or more newish energy firms snapping at the heels of the big six who understand that loyalty matters. And obviously, some of them are more impressive than others, but they all have one thing in common. They're hungry. They know that they've got to impress and delight their clients because they can't rely on exploiting a back book of long-term customers to stay fat and happy. The figures are stark, Madam Deputy Speaker. Roughly two-thirds of all customers, that's at least 20 million households, are on the expensive rip-off deals, the standard variable tariff, or SVT. And while a minority of customers switch to a different energy supplier regularly, most of us don't. The amount of switching has been creeping upwards, but a lot of the change has been the same bargain hunters churning around and around in ever faster circles between different energy firms. The number of households who have rarely or never switched remains stubbornly high, which suits the big six just fine. So what's the answer? How do we put energy customers in the driving seat, giving them the same power to choose a new supplier as easily as we'd switch to a different brand of toothpaste or coffee? Make the energy firms compete to delight us rather than quietly exploiting us instead. Well, firstly, we've got to make switching a lot easier. Choosing that different brand of toothpaste in a supermarket is easy. You just pick up a different tube off the shelf. But too many people find switching to a different energy firm scary and stressful, and they're frightened off as a result. Even the price comparison sites who have an interest in making the process as simple and easy as possible say they lose huge numbers of customers who abandon their search the moment they're asked a basic essential question, like what your current energy usage is. Others think that switching is likely to go wrong, so they might end up cold and shivering in a home without power if the move doesn't happen smoothly. My honourable friend has already mentioned the impact, on some households at least, of the new smart meters. 
And still others of us just simply haven't got the time. Many of us lead busy lives, juggling careers, childcare, school runs, and goodness knows what else. Switching our energy supplier can easily become one of those things that we all know we ought to do, like washing the car or joining a gym, but we never quite get round to doing. The difference is, of course, that those other products don't automatically switch you to a super expensive brand of toothpaste or coffee unless you tell them not to. They don't expect you to be on your toes all the time, to stop them changing the terms of your deal and ripping you off when you're not looking. For toothpaste, coffee and almost everything else, loyalty and inertia work in the customer's favour. They're on our side, but not with energy. If you relax, they'll have you. Fortunately, there are some simple things which will make switching easier, less stressful, simpler and not so scary. The main one is making our customer data easily available to a new energy firm if we give them our permission. That way we don't have to fill in endless online pages with information we can't remember or we haven't got. At the moment, the information can take days to come through and the big six throw all sorts of obstacles in the way. They have no interest in making the process easy or simple after all. In future, we should just be able to ask our new firm to get it from our existing supplier in a few seconds with a click of a mouse or the tick of a box. Simple, quick, easy and safe. The number of people switching will go through the roof if we do this. Next, there are end-to-end -end services provided by firms happily. Agree. To the Honourable me Member, and he's making a very good point, which I agree with. But will he agree with me also that it is more problematic, for example, people who live in tower blocks, where the supply, energy supply, is a collectively uh, made by the landlord, who might not have any incentive to switch to another supplier? Madam Deputy Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman is exactly right. One of the things which may be improved by the rollout of smart meters, which we've been he hearing about earlier on, would be to break down some of those collective bills. Um, the concerns amongst many energy suppliers and others in the industry, of course, is that smart meters may also be being over-invested in too many hopes and that they will not do necessarily um, produce a lasting uplift, uplift in the levels of customer engagement and interest. They will start off as a very interesting and, and new gadget in the corner of the room, but after a few weeks or months, that interest may die away. We will have to wait and see, but he's right, there is an opportunity there, at the very least. Next, Madam Deputy Speaker, in this spirit of trying to make switching easier and simpler and less scary, there are end-to-end -end services provided like, by firms like Make It Cheaper or Flipper or Over or Money Saving Expert, which do the donkey work for us handling everything from finding a better deal to organising the switch itself. They appeal to those of us who currently think even the most convenient price comparison sites take too much of our valuable time as well. Would and that means... Ah, like. Would my honourable friend not agree with me? Part of the problem of the big six and other generators like Veolia is they're not straightforward and honest with their customers and stakeholders. And until they're straightforward and honest, there is going to be this disquiet at their conduct. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, that is, I think, one of the underlying concerns about the way that this industry operates, that people feel that uh, even when, because they haven't necessarily been asked at the moment when they may be switched onto the default tariff, that they feel when they notice it, if they notice it, that they are being ripped off because those default tariffs are so much higher. And that leads to distrust and distrust in the suppliers, and that is one of the things which is corroding the underlying level of trust in the industry as a whole. It's incredibly dangerous, and I think that some forward-thinking people in the industry understand this and understand the brand damage which is being done not just to individual firms, but to the sector as a whole. Um, that is slow to, to, uh, to, to gain that trust and easy to lose. The Honourable Gentleman has a background in consumer uh, marketing and, and consumer uh, 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 business, so he will understand, I'm sure, what I mean. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, if we can, if we can look at the effects of these end-to-end -end services I was just mem mentioning, introducing them and rolling them out, they are still in their infancy, should introduce another new group of customers who don't currently switch at all, and they, but they will be perhaps persuaded to do so in future, extending the number of people in that stubborn two-thirds or so of the customer base who don't switch or have very rarely switched at all. Madam Deputy Speaker, these changes taken together are essential steps to solve the underlying fundamental problems which make the energy market 
such a ripoff. If the government, the regulator Ofgem, and perhaps even enlightened energy firms themselves are willing to take them, the abuses and consumer detriment will start to fall. Customers will finally be in the driving seat, like we already are and we expect to be for everything else, from toothpaste and coffee to cornflakes and soap. But how long will it take to fix? How quickly will the rip-off stop? And will there still be stubborn pockets of, of problems left over here and there even then? Given that fully two-thirds of all customers are on these rip-off tariffs and that proportion has been glacially slow to change, there is an awfully long way still to go. Even under the most optimistic scenarios, an unacceptably large number of households will still be being ripped off for too many years yet. So, we need a stopgap as well. A temporary solution while all those other changes to make switching easier and less scary start to work and to take effect. The answer is a relative price cap, a maximum markup between each energy firm's best deal and their default tariff. It would mean that once your existing deal comes to an end, if you forget to switch to a new one, then you won't be ripped off too badly. But there will still be plenty of money you can save when you get round to switching again, so it will always still be worth your while to become engaged and to take that additional action should you be so minded. And energy firms would still be able, under these proposals, to compete on price. They could still decide if they want to be the Aldi or Lidl of the industry, or the Waitrose or the Marks and Spencer. Plus, energy firms under these proposals could still have as many tariffs as they wanted, so there'd be plenty of customer choice. If you want a green energy tariff, that'd be fine. If you don't like computers or want to do it the old-fashioned way with offline paper and an ink deal, no problem. So I'm delighted to confirm today, Madam Deputy Speaker, that this idea for a relative cap is supported by three of the largest challenger brands, Ovo, Utility Warehouse and Octopus Energy, covering hundreds of thousands of customers between them, and I hope to persuade others to join the, the cause in due course. But crucially, a relative cap is, I would argue, rather better, a lot better than a normal price cap. A relative cap means that each energy firm can still adjust their prices whenever the wholesale price of gas or electricity goes up or down. But a normal one means Ofgem has to approve any changes, which will inevitably be slower and create work for lawyers and for lobbyists too. A relative cap also means energy firms still have plenty of incentives to innovate, finding new ways to please particular groups of customers in whatever ways they want, without needing Ofgem's approval first. So, lobbyists and lawyers will hate the relative cap, because there will be much less lobbying and lawyering to do. Putting customers in the driver's seat means fewer fat fees and fat lunches. If customers can switch their supplier as easily as changing their brand of cornflakes or soap, then we politicians and the bureaucrats and the regulators will rightly matter a lot less than we used to in this area. And because of this extra clarity and simplicity, a relative cap means that we can deregulate too, striking out reams of other regulations, red tape and guidelines which currently complicate the market, stopping energy firms from thinking about their customers first and foremost and making them focus on their regulators their lawyers and their compliance directors instead. A relative cap reduces red tape rather than adding to it. But the people who will hate the relative cap the most are the big six, because it will force them to treat us, their consumers, fairly, to reward loyalty rather than exploiting it, to fight hard to keep long-standing customers rather than taking us for granted. In other words, to be a normal industry with normal firms where the customer is king and not the regulator or the politicians, but the customer instead. Madam Deputy Speaker, I know that both ministers and regulators understand this problem. They've spoken to me and to many others in this House about it in the past, and both the Secretary of State and the Prime Minister have been trenchant in their criticisms of how the sector is not delivering an economy that works for everyone. So I hope that they will accept the thrust of this motion, that the time for action has come. We simply cannot argue, as others have tried to do, that even though fully two-thirds of the country are being ripped off, we just aren't going to help or protect those victims because it's their own silly fault if they aren't savvy enough to switch.
Yes, we need to make switching easier and safer, so that eventually most of us do it most of the time. That's clearly the right long-term answer. But until that glorious day, Madam Deputy Speaker, I hope Ministers will accept that we cannot simply sit back and allow consumers to be harmed on this scale for this long and do nothing. We need to do more.